Hello and welcome to the World Hatchery Forum, a webinar series focused on practical solutions for hatchery managers. Through four webinars, the series will discuss fish and shrimp feeds and genetics, as well as recent equipment and technology innovations. My name is Lucia Barreiro, editor of Hatchery Feed and Management, and I will be your moderator. This is the fourth in the series that will discuss new hatchery equipment and technologies. Each speaker will give a 15 minute presentation and then we will get to a final panel session to answer questions from the audience. To submit a question, please type it in the Q&A box. Special thanks to our assistant editor and webinar manager, Marisa Yanaga, for making all things work. And let's start with the first speaker, Warren Russell, Chief Commercial Officer at Moliar. Warren is an experienced entrepreneur with over 15 years of business management experience in the wastewater treatment and environmental services industries in, of Southern Africa and the Middle East. Prior to leading the commercial efforts for Moliar, Warren, a graduate of the University of South Africa, founded Aerofit USA and Everdeen Technologies, which focused on environmental consulting and designing wastewater treatment processes for municipal, industrial, oil and gas applications. The title of his presentation is Nanobubble Technology Optimizes Aquaculture Systems. Warren, hand it over to you. Thank you so much. I will share my screen. Can everybody see that okay? Not yet. Coming through. How about now? It's okay now. All right. Perfect. Good night. Good afternoon, everybody. I appreciate everybody's time and, and uh, attention today. Uh, my name is Warren Russell, as, as was introduced. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer of Molio. I'm going to kick this off and, and explain a little bit about Nanobubbles, what we do as a company, and uh, how they can be utilized in the field of, of aquaculture, and specifically hatcheries in this moment. Um, a quick introduction about, about Nanobubbles, a little bit, and about our company. We are based in Los Angeles and in, in California in the US. Um, we, we do consider ourselves a, a, sort of a global leader in, this, in the manufacturing of industrial scale nanobubble systems. Uh, we operate in a large number of different countries. Uh, currently have deployed roughly around 1800 systems in a variety of different applications ranging from horticulture, treating uh, irrigation water to algae controlled surface water um, and that may include everything from, from shrimp hatcheries uh, to open, open ponds and also oil and gas and, and um, other applications that all are centered around the role of nanobubbles in different processes that basically deliver some kind of enhancement to efficiency of use of those resources or improving the recovery of those resources in certain ways. So a little bit about nanobubbles, real quick introduction. It is a scale of the size of the bubble. That scale of the bubble in our context is roughly about 120 nanometers in size. That's extremely small. It's around 2,500 times smaller than a grain of salt. Um, and what's, what's unique, once you get a bubble down to that size, it actually retains more about the properties of a colloidal particle than actually a bubble itself. And once you have this bubble at a, a certain scale, it does become stable in solution, just like a colloidal particle. And one of the principal reasons why that bubble is stable in solution is relative to its electrically, electrochemically charged surface. So it's, it's a negatively charged um, particle that gives its sort of repulsion and keeps it stable, just like a colloidal particle. But it's that charged surface that provides some very unique properties as it relates to treating water in certain ways and enhancing different kinds of processes um, along that way. And one of the best examples of that exact uh, benefit of an anabol in, in solution is its ability to disrupt and remove biofilm from surfaces. 
So as you know, in any kind of uh, surface to liquid contact, you have the development of, of bacteria that establish biofilm, which can be very stubborn and difficult to remove from those surfaces. They can harbor pathogens and certain types of unwanted bacteria. And what we found is the role of having nanobubbles moving through a system is very effective at disrupting those bio biological matrices from those surfaces and helping to bring them into um, bulk solution where they can remove, be removed when activated through other processes. Just a quick idea about validation. If you're looking at a, a glass of water with nanobubbles, we're talking about concentrations that could be up to hundreds, if not billions of nanobubbles per milliliter of water. It's an extremely high surface area, um, but you cannot see them. Uh, so one of the best methods that we use and is a well-established method of, of uh, not only classifying size and, con and concentration of those bubbles is a, an instrument called the nanocyte. That's a laser particle analysis. It's very commonly used in different universities looking at particles in, in, in solution. We use this and this is how we validate not only surface charge, but the concentration of these bubbles. Um, we do use our technology to deliver a, a wide variety of gases, um, depending on the application, obviously in, in, in aquaculture and hatcheries, we've, we focused around the role of uh, delivering oxygen very efficiently. And, and we have gone through various kinds of validations, particularly from our background in water treatment, looking at how we can utilize uh, nanobubbles to deliver and, and dissolve um, oxygen very efficiently into solution. And one of the key takeaways from that research is that not only is it a, a very efficient um, method of injecting gas into solution, but it also is not uh, susceptible to some of the limitations that conventional aeration um, or oxygenation devices like diffusers may have with regards to other inhibitory compounds in that water that diminish the, the concentrate or the dissolution of gas into solution. The other role of nanobubbles is that it can be used for the removal of certain kind of contaminants and that is uh, utilized through a com combination of fractionation and oxidation utilized from these bubbles as they may be able to remove certain, certain kinds of particulate from solution as well as oxidizing um, those contaminants. One of the key overviews about nanobubbles as it relates to our core technology is, is we essentially are bringing in water at certain, certain flow rates. We have a pretty wide range of, of styles of systems that deliver various kinds of flows to meet the capacities of a particular system. But what's unique about this process is that we're actually injecting two forms of gas into solution. One of which is the immediate dissolution of the gas as we're injecting it, but the other is also um, the production of these nanobubbles that, that will become stable in solution. The benefit of that is you have a very evenly distribution of dissolved gas in solution. Um, as well as the ability of increasing and elevating that ORP uniformly in that water column. And that ultimately has some pretty significant benefits as it relates to the general water quality or water quality improvement um, that the system can deliver. Just to give everybody a, a sort of a quick overshot of what these systems may look like, they are purpose-built systems. We, depending on the application, depending on the market, you may find different needs and wants out of a particular system. The NEO, for example, is a turnkey, turnkey system that delivers and um, injects its own oxygen into that system. The one that we most commonly use uh, is uh, this Nexus style inline system. And the idea is, especially as you see the, the movement towards more recirculating systems, the ability to integrate oxygenation with inline uh, recirculation is highly advantageous to be to being more efficient with your energy and overall operating costs um, of, of that system. And just to give you a, a quick overview of what that may look like in, in field and practice, um, you're looking at a couple of inline systems that's either taking a side stream of an existing higher flow of liquid um, using a, a gate valve to provide a negative pressure and the diversion of, of um, that flow through a core technology. And, and why that's highly advantageous is obviously we're utilizing the existing energy um, that's already inherently part of a, of a recirculating process. And in other cases, you're either re um, replacing um, or retrofitting against other sort of, either could be outdated 
uh, pumps or, or, or conventional oxidation systems that have, uh, are not meeting the capacity needs of a particular system. So in many cases, you could look at this as a supplemental source for improving the oxygen um, uh, levels or sort of the dissolved oxygen saturation points of a system. You could be balancing to a certain set point so that you're optimizing your feed conversion ratios. Alternatively, you may be looking at this to introduce nanobubbles in a way to promote the water quality in, in some capacity. Each, each system, whether it's delivering oxygen through diffusers, cones, venturis, asparges, they each have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, here, we, what we're really focused on today is, is not only the efficiency of that gas transfer, but really the role of the nanobubbles as they may improve both um, or reduce disease pressures and other water quality metrics that, that may be important that, that are not well served by other conventional methods of, of oxygenation or aeration. What we see as a sort of the key driver um, is certainly sort of from the inbound from, from the customers is the drive for more uh, efficient means of those resources. So if you look at increasing energy prices in Europe or, or globally for that matter, um, high energy pumps, high energy systems to, to either recirculate or provide oxygenation, there's a driver to do that more efficiently. And then particularly as you're moving towards more, more land-based grow-out systems and RAS, um, again, a strong driver to, to, for each one of those processes to be more efficient. And here we're looking at the role of nanobubbles and improving things like the protein removal through that fractionation and deemulsification of uh, sort of those unwanted uh, compounds that are in solution. We're looking at utilizing those nanobubbles to promote biological nutrient removal, specifically ammonia oxidation, as well as the mitigation of H2S. And that comes back to the role of the nanobubble being able to disrupt those um, biological matrices and other dead zones where these, these um, bacteria can, can reproduce. Also, as it, as it relates to the role of, of um, uh, these systems driving towards higher stocking densities, intensification of systems, generally in conjunction with those sort of demands, you come with more constraints on, on the system and being able to maintain high water quality, as well as just optimizing um, the gas transfer to support um, those higher demands on the system. And then of course, the welfare of the fish, uh, maintaining better, better quality of water, um, maintaining um, better oxidation potential of that water, and minimizing the disease pressures through those um, poorer water quality metrics. So as a, as a whole, um, we, we, we see the big demand within the industry to look for the more efficient utilization of these gases to support uh, better oxygen levels to maintain uh, better feed conversion ratios, all the while driving towards intensification and better, better use um, out of those um, given infrastructures. Our system is used in a, a, a pretty wide variety of, of applications and, and types of facilities, everything from flow through and a small production uh, to core systems, open ponds, as well as um, uh, smaller contained systems. Again, the, the benefit, um, whether it's a flow through and you've got, uh, in some cases we have um, examples where the water has higher levels of, of nitrogen, other gases, in solution, we need to um, remove or displace some of those those um, unwanted gases to, to bring the total partial pressures of that oxygen back to a, a regular level. Or alternatively, in some cases like this, where we're injecting ozone nanobubbles uh, to to really maintain um, the, the, the or mitigate any disease pressures that may be coming through that system. And then, of course, the, the most obvious of which is is efficient oxygenation. Um, within these systems. Um, recirculating aquaculture systems, uh, the demand typically is, is sort of modulating the, the, the oxygen control in each system. You'll find that quite frequently you have different biomasses in, 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 in different cells and the ability to, to very finitely maintain um, oxygen levels within that system um, in the most efficient manner in a way and creating all these um, sort of better metrics with regards to the water quality. But again, where we see some of the best opportunity and in, in for um, the role of nanobubbles relates to enhancing these 
treatment processes within a recirculating system. And specifically, I'm talking about better particulate protein removal through the, the, the protein skimming, as well as better ammonia, uh, efficient, in, in better efficient removal of ammonia as well. And then obviously uh, the mitigation of, of um, some of those uh, H2S factors. I've thrown in a couple of case studies here just to give you a, a, a perfect overview of, of this is one of the best examples um, of a, a, a sort of a holy grail of, of what we try to accomplish with our support technology. Yeah, we have a, a, a recirculating hatchery in, in Canada that we did a retrofit on. Basically what happened is the existing LHO was battling to maintain dissolved oxygen levels throughout the system due to the increase in biomass that they were maintaining in the system. We did a retrofit, added ozone, oxygen nanobubbles to this facility. Not only were we able to demonstrate a redu reduction in the amount of oxygen used, but, but within that, being able to maintain that higher saturation point, we were able to convert that to a higher feed conversion ratio. And when you look at that, that ratio and metric relative to the amount of oxygen, oxygen utilized in conjunction with the, the, the mass or, or weight gain over the uh, this particular interval of 30 days, you see a pretty substantial increase of 48% over and above the conventional system. So that's one of the best examples of what we aim to do. Then alternatively, retrofitting cones. Cones in the ideal situation can be a very efficient means of oxygenation. In practice, so we find that a lot of installations are not operated correctly and generally the limitation with the ramp up and wrap down and, and just the, those ideal operating parameters are not typically met. This is an example of a, a project we did in Chile where we did a retrofit of a cone to support a, um, about 10 systems of, I mean, 10 tanks with, with um, uh, uh, salmon smolt. Um, and here you see a pretty substantial reduction in both uh, oxygen utilization and energy, energy being one of the biggest drivers for that cost savings to the customers. This one more example here of, of um, another flow through hatchery. This particular example is in Chile as well. Um, here you had uh, the feed water coming in with a higher level of, of dissolved nitrogen in this water. They didn't have degassing capability. So what we had to do here is, is do supplemental oxygenation, but operating the equipment in a way where we could both uh, dissolve the oxygen in solution, but also strip some of that nitrogen out. And we were able to reduce this, this uh, dissolved nitrogen down from 106% down to about 95, 96% saturation. So overall, a pretty substantial reduction in nitrogen uh, in conjunction with the increase in the oxygen. And we attribute that largely to the increased uh, partial pressure of the gas, or the higher partial pressure of, of gas inside that solution. And just lastly, just a couple of last points here. Ozone, again, alternatively as a, as a comparison against um, in introducing um, uh, ozone through nanobubbles compared to the most conventional, which is Venturi, opportunity for much better half-life and saturation rate of ozone, but also most importantly, off-gassing. Um, you can see that comparison of very substantial reduction off-gassing, which again, if you're utilizing ozone in your system, uh, that's gonna be a health and safety risk if you can smell it. So we wanna, we wanna minimize that off-gassing and maximize the treatment potential of ozone. And then <clears throat> lastly, on the ammonia uh, removal, here we just have a, a, a perfect example of a comparison, equal levels of dissolved oxygen, looking, looking at the biomass kinetics and how these uh, oxygen nanobubbles can, can improve that ammonia oxidation. So if you're looking at your, bio, your biofiltration, biological nutrient removal, you will see um, uh, about a 15%, 15 to 20% improvement in capacity. Um, so if, you, if you're aiming to increase your stocking density with the existing infrastructure, the ability to remove um, ammonia more efficiently with oxygen nanobubbles can be a significant uh, benefit. And then another one, which not so picture on, on hatchery unless you're doing grow out, but again, just an example of how nanobubbles can, can actually help to tar move, remove these targeted unwanted compounds. In a case of grow outs, you have, you have MIB and jasmine um, and here we just sort of university research have demonstrated a very, a very effective way of just these oxygen nanobubbles on their own being able to remove all flavor compounds from that solution. And so I'll just wrap up. I mean, um, 
a, a pretty wide variety. Uh, we, we're utilizing our systems in all parts of the world, different processes, different kinds of fish. But again, I would point you to there's, there's some great research coming out globally. Um, and if you're looking at either ozone nanobubbles in a ways to mitigate diseases and disease pressures um, to fish health, um, I've just thrown up a, a couple of examples that are, are fairly recent here. And you can see uh, whether it's uh, water quality improvements, uh, immune responses in the fish, stocking density, better water quality metrics throughout. Um, each one of these papers will talk to uh, those kinds of benefits. And so I welcome people to continue to research and this great, great work being done on the global, global base. And um, I thank everybody for your time today. And uh, please uh, let me know if you guys have any questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Warren. Great presentation. Our next speaker is Bertrand Bahut. Bertrand is the CTO of Coldep, where he is in charge of all kinds of projects. He has an MSc in, bio in biology and oceanography with a PhD in aquaculture engineering. He has 15 years of experience in water treatment, especially in RAS. The title of his presentation is The Bakun Airlift Technology Applications in Aquaculture Hatcheries. Bertrand, hand it over to you. Thanks, Lucia. Thanks for um, inviting me and allowing me to present to this um, conference. Um, I will start my presentation. Up. Okay. So, uh, so I'm Bertrand Maru. I'm uh, working for Coldep, a French uh, company. I'm the CTO in charge of all projects, R&D projects. Um, so I will, uh, Coldep is um, providing and developing uh, an innovative technology, the vacuum airlift. So this technology is used for, um, for many um, different applications. So including oil and gas, desalination, decarbonation, aquaculture, algoculture, and aquarium. Uh, so here I will focus, of course, on aquaculture and specifically on uh, hatcheries uh, farming. So this uh, technology is a multifunctional uh, water treatment process. Uh, it allows to circulate water as well as uh, exchange gases and extract particulates and dissolved organic compounds. This all together or, uh, or one by one. Uh, it has thus uh, many advantages such as the fact that uh, we don't use any chemicals for this treatment. We, um, we have a vertical treatment. That means we have a very small footprint. It's uh, easy functioning, simple, and of course, it has a very low energy because we uh, on work uh, with vacuum and, uh, and vacuum pump. So that means we circulate water using air injection. And, uh, and this makes the treatment efficient and economic. So very quickly, uh, how it works. Uh, so here is just um, a slide to show you that the technology has to be over the water level of the tank we have to treat because we do the treatment under vacuum. So, but if you want to have more details and information on the, the technology, I suggest you go and check uh, the publication, the publication that uh, I uh, made during my PhD on the system. And uh, actually those publications get uh, very nice awards from the Aquaculture Engineering Society. So, um, so if you want, you can have the references down here. So now concerning the first function of water circulation, so here you have an example of the water we can circulate with different uh, model of uh, the vacuum lift we have. This is the big one. We also have small ones for small um, water flows. This um, here you can see the difference between uh, a, a flow in fresh or in seawater. Uh, it's mainly due to the size of the bubbles that are different uh, and, and because of coalescence in fresh water. However, uh, in, any, in both cases, you can have a very high uh, water flow with very low energy, as long as you respect a low head at uh, the end. That means uh, the lift should over, always be below one meter. For gas exchanges, 
So uh, the, um, the treatment, uh, the, the technology is under vacuum. So that means that uh, we, um, we increase stripping efficiency of gases using vacuum. Uh, so of course, when we are faced to, uh, to some uh, CO2 um, supersaturation issues, we can size the system in order to remove uh, the CO2 that is produced. So we have different, um, we have different model to adapt to uh, to to the farm. Uh, what is very important for um, in terms of CO2 stripping is that we do that without any uh, media. That means there is no risk of off flavor production in the CO2 stripping system in our technology. Together with CO2 stripping, we also uh, strip all uh, nitrogen. And this is very important, uh, specifically in hatcheries, where sometimes you are, you are faced to um, nitrogen supersaturation, and uh, that can allow uh, gas bubble disease uh, in the fishes. So uh, using the technology, it's impossible to add the outlet of the, of the system to be over 100% of saturation in nitrogen. It's the first gas that is stripped, and uh, it's uh, it's always below this uh, this saturation. So it, you can't have uh, nitrogen supersaturation uh, with using the technology. For oxygen uh, dissolution, we um, so when we strip gases such as uh, CO two, nitrogen, and H two S, for example, we uh, we do it in the inner tube, uh, the rising tube, uh, and then. When in the downcomer tube, outer tube, we uh, can at the, at the end, before uh, the water goes out of the system, we can uh, inject pure oxygen with high efficiency of dissolution because uh, since we have stripped all the gases, we have a lot of place, a lot of room for the, for the oxygen to get dissolved into the water. Concerning now from fractionation, I will mainly focus on this function. Uh, it's uh, the reason we are mainly use the, use the, using the technology. Uh, so for form fractionation, we have uh, some customers uh, that, um, that we, we were in contact with as test the technology compared to different other protein schemas. They have uh, shown that uh, the efficiency of our technology was higher than standard protein schemas and you, also, they were, the, the system were, was using less energy. So this higher efficiency is uh, due to uh, the action of vacuum, because uh, using vacuum increase uh, the flotation of all um, gases uh, particulates, including uh, living uh, organisms such as microalgae, uh, bacteria, uh, and uh, parasites, for example. And uh, also, we, uh, we have um, developed a kind of quite a high tech uh, regulation uh, system of the water level at the top of the system in order to always have uh, a continuous uh, form extraction. And we also can regulate this, uh, this uh, always uh, to, 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 to never ha have any stop in the form extraction. And what is also important is that the form that is for, for, formed at the top of the system is always continuously extracted by the vacuum uh, sucking at the top. So uh, if you add all these um, this, uh, benefits, you have a system that is very high in terms of efficiency. And then what is also kind of important is very important is that the technology is um, moving the water itself. So we don't need to add a specific water pump to the, to the skimmer. It's, it's doing the water circulation together with the, 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 the particulate extraction, the foam fractionation. So that's the main reason why the, the, we, we do use uh, less energy than standard uh, skimmers. In terms of extraction, uh, you can see uh, um, a figure that shows the particle size that we extract, but this uh, does not include all uh, dissolved parts. So as you can see uh, in pictures, uh, we um, can use the technology in seawater, of course, but also in freshwater, which um, is not that evident because uh, some uh, it has been uh, always said that the skimmers are not really working in uh, freshwater. And um, 
which is uh, not true actually. It's it's just the question is just uh, that the foam that is uh, formed at the top of uh, of the of uh, of a schema is is much lower in terms of uh, of um, height than than uh, than in seawater. So that means you have to uh, to have very um, accurate uh, regulation if you want to only remove this uh, small layer of foam of concentrated foam. Uh, and not dilute it with uh, the the the, what, the the rearing water. So uh, and but as long as you can, as long as you are able to do that, then you can really concentrate uh, the foam and ha and have a, a nice uh, a nice foam fractionation and nice particulate and dissolved organic compounds extraction in fresh water. So of course in seawater there is no problem. It's it's, it's working very well and it's easy to to use uh, schemas. Um, by uh, foam fractionation, we also have to, 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 to talk about biosecurity, which is very important in hatchery. Uh, using foam fractionation uh, with our technology allows to extract uh, all bacteria in, uh, concentrated in the water. We have uh, made uh, many tested, uh, tests in, um, in seawater, specifically for, the, for a very important application we have in aquaculture, which is the shellfish depuration. It's actually uh, big things here in France uh, because we we do consume a lot of shellfish, uh, specifically oysters, and and we we need to depurate the shellfish because we eat uh, those shellfish alive. And um, and then so we since two years we it's, it's an application we have been um, uh, reference in terms of treatment for this uh, for this application. So we have made a lot of tests to show the efficiency of bacterial removal by foam fractionation using the vacuum airlift. And we made that with different uh, shellfish and different bacteria. Here's, here is E. coli, but we also made the test with salmonella and uh, vibrio, vibrio. And we have shown always the, the, the extraction of uh, all bacteria within uh, 24 hours. And even 12 hours is, is enough. We also have made tests uh, concerning virus extraction. Uh, here it was uh, some tests uh, with the Noda virus. Um, the Noda virus is, uh, is a seawater virus that is a kind of issue for um, sea bream and sea bass, uh, European sea bass uh, uh, farming. We have shown the extraction of uh, this virus uh, using the foam fractionation uh, function of uh, the vacuum airlift. Also very important um, in uh, fish farming, uh, the whole flavor reduction. Uh, we have uh, used the system to remove, to, to, to extract and concentrate the geosmine uh, and, and, and concentrate the geosmine in the foam using the vacuum airlift. And uh, we did some tests without ozone. And after that, uh, we also did some tests using ozone. Of course, if you add ozone to foam fractionation for, uh, for off flavor removal, it's, uh, it's even better. But uh, using the system allows uh, already to extract uh, a lot of geosmine and, uh, from the water and, and avoid any problem of any risk of off um, uh, flavor. We uh, here are some uh, applications we, we have made so far in uh, aquaculture. So first in uh, fish farming uh, ras, for example, uh, here you have uh, a pike perch ras in Switzerland. Uh, in this ras, we are using the system for both uh, gas tripping and uh, foam fractionation uh, with the possibility of using ozone. Uh, after that, you have um, uh, sturgeon purging tanks in uh, Madagascar. Uh, here we only use the system for foam fractionation uh, with ozone, and in order to 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 avoid any uh, any risk of uh, off flavor production and uh, and uh, specifically uh, the for the for the caviar that is produced uh, with the, the with the sturgeon female. Uh, an application uh, only for gas tripping and oxygenation in uh, in USA for a kind of perch, uh, species, uh, American perch, uh, the walleye. Uh, it's uh, here we 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 have a, a, a pumping uh, uh, fresh water that is um, over super saturated with uh, nitrogen and CO two. So we use the technology to 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 
to extract and strip all these uh, gases before it comes into the hatchery. Uh, below you have uh, rainbow true trust, an example of a uh, system that is used for both stripping and uh, foam fractionation again. Another hatchery where we use the technology to, to, use it, to extract particulates uh, from a raw seawater uh, before it comes into the hatchery. Uh, here is mainly uh, extraction of uh, bacteria, uh, microalgae and things like that. Uh, then also we have a, a salmon farm in USA using the technology to make foam fractionation continuously to clarify the water and uh, again extract particulates and uh, dissolve organic uh, uh, matters. Uh, another application, it's not exactly aquaculture for you, but it's a public aquarium, which is uh, also a seawater treatment or fresh water, but here is more seawater. We, it's an application we have developed now since also one, two years. And it's very important for us because um, we, are, we are setting up systems in uh, uh, all <laughs> French aquarium, one by one, one after one. And uh, there are many coming uh, soon. Uh, here, the, the, the point is to really uh, increase the water quality in terms of uh, transmittance, in terms of, um, of um, clearness. We, have, um, we can size the system for the, for the tank uh, used, and uh, we do the, we do the, 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 the end, the, how do you say, the finishing of the, the treatment after, for example, sand filtration, which is, which is uh, class, classically used in a public aquarium. So, uh, so, and the result is very important uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, for the visitors in terms of quality. Uh, but uh, in fact, after, uh, uh, together to do this, to this uh, clarification of water and improvement in water quality, you have all the rest that is done to the, the water in terms of gas exchange, in terms of uh, um, uh, small uh, uh, disorganic um, compounds removal that also makes the fish uh, more comfortable. And what we have shown is that uh, in some tanks, uh, uh, some big, big tanks in this aquarium, we have the fish that are feeling uh, much better and that are starting to to, to grow again when, when they ha had stopped to grow uh, since a couple of years and they, they start to grow again. And so there are many advantages that than just uh, have, having the a better quality of water in terms of um, transmittance. It's also all the rest that is important. Uh, and this application of uh, shellfish depuration, uh, very important. Uh, so uh, we use the technology to, to extract uh, mainly bacteria, but uh, all, uh, all possible uh, viruses and microalgae as well. And we can use ozone or not. Uh, usually we, we have the technology that is, um, uh, uh, that is together with uh, UV uh, because it's a kind of a law in France that you, you have to have a UV uh, sterilization at, after in the treatment. So this is some kind of application, some kind of example of uh, for shellfish. Uh, here again, some shellfish depuration uh, uh, examples. And uh, so uh, before I conclude this, I have to say that for hatchery, it's, uh, you can use the technology for, for the, before uh, in, the, in the inlet treatment, before you get the water into the hatchery as, as a, pre-treatment of the, the sea water or fresh water, but you can also use, of course, the technology in, in the, the RAS, in the, in the re hatchery uh, recycling system in order to, to, to continuously treat the water, extract gas, avoid any risk of uh, super saturation of nitrogen, uh, reduce the concentration of CO2, extra, ex extract eventually if you have any development of H2S, and, and as well as water clarification, extraction of bacteria, biosecurity, extraction of all uh, off flavors, uh, which is maybe less important in hatchery, but, um, but at least it, it's always having an, a water quality improvement that is very important. So it, the technology is not only uh, used as foam fractionator, it's, it's also used as gas exchanges. It, it makes all the water uh, make, uh, increase in terms of water quality in order to, to to save uh, uh, to, to save uh, fishes and to to increase the the, the 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 biomass and survivals. So well, that that's it for me. And um, so I, I we have um, if you want more information, you have my email and and you can uh, you can look at uh, have a look at the website 
uh, if you want it. Uh, that would that would, that is nice. Okay, uh, thanks. Thank you, Bertrand. Nice presentation. Our next speaker is Jasmine Hayes, principal scientist at Kitos, again university spin-off company that develops microbial fingerprinting technologies to create actionable microbiome insights. Her PhD research aimed to acquire insights into the microbial ecology of reading water bacterial communities. Currently, she is further working on developing novel technologies to measure microbiome health, as well as understanding the importance of microbiome variation across aquaculture systems. The, the title of her presentation is Microbial Fingerprinting Enables Precise Microbial Health Management in Hatcheries. Jasmine, hand it over to you. Thank you, Lucia, and uh, also thank you for organizing the seminar today and for uh, inviting me as a speaker. So um, as Lucia said, my talk today will be about microbial fingerprinting technologies uh, for, um, is this, oh, activate my pointer, for uh, microbiome management in hatcheries, but also uh, in general in aquaculture systems. And that is what the company Kaitos, where I work, is really about. Uh, so Kaitos is a spin-off company from Ghent University that's only founded about one year ago. And uh, since it's such a young company, you may not uh, have heard it. So I will take my first few slides to show you a little bit what the gap is in industry that we would like to, to fill up. And then I will show you some examples of where we did that microbiome management uh, successfully. So before I start, it's maybe important that we have a look at how we are managing the microbiome in aquaculture systems today. Uh, so what happens is uh, typically something at the farm happens, a small change that causes an unwanted um, divergence of the microbiome. So that can be, for example, using a live feed or using some water uh, to start up your cultivation that actually does not have an optimal microbiome. Or maybe we use some, some kind of disinfection that uh, kills only a part of the bacteria in the system and in that way causes a very imbalanced microbiome, which is not uh, ideal for cultivation of organisms. So what happens after this uh, shift that we introduced, after a few days, it typically takes a few days, the cultivated organisms will start to be affected by this. So they will not eat very well, they start to have deformities or even die. Then typically it also takes a day or even a few days for the farmer to see that there's actually something wrong in the system, that there's some mortality or that there's a lot of uneaten feed in the system. And at that point, the farmer will decide to take some action to try to mitigate this problem. So he will use some kind of disinfection or some probiotics in hopes that this will fix uh, the problem and the cultivation will not be lost completely. Now, if we look at this, we actually can see that there's room for improvement and there's two big things where we could improve on. And the first is that the farmer is actually missing timely insights into the microbiome. Because the moment the farmer decides to take an action is actually the moment that there's already damage in his cultivation system. While the moment where the um, initial shift in the microbiome was induced was already a few days before. So these insights are actually always a little bit uh, too late. Secondly, what we also um, see is that there's mainly a blind mitigation. And we call this blind mitigation because what happens is that the farmer starts to use some kind of disinfection product or some kind of probiotics in hopes that the cultivation will be uh, going better. But actually, the farmer does not know what the origin is of this dysbiosis or the origin is of this um, yeah, bad performance in this cultivation. So both of these aspects are what the company Kytos with our technology is trying to improve on. So we like to call what we do uh, providing microbiome management at your service or at your fingertips, because it's really the idea that we bring the tools to do that microbiome management on time and very effectively towards the farmer so that the farmer has all the info that they need to make an informed decision to manage their system better. We built our technologies around four pillars, which we want to improve. So the first is disease risk. So we want to make sure that the pressure of pathogens is as low as possible. And for this, we have specific indicators, with, which I will show later. Uh, we want to improve general water quality. We also want to increase uh, the stability of cultivation system, because as many of you have experienced probably, 
if you have all kinds of replicate cultivations, not all of your prawns will have the same performance, even though you're treating them exactly the same. So this is something we would like to improve on as well with our technologies. And then finally, we want to increase the overall microbiome health. So we don't want to just focus on the pathogens and the bad bacteria or the bad algae in your system. We want to look at the complete microbiome and make that as optimal as possible to have a good cultivation system. Now, um, we are developing technologies to do this management, but it's important also to have a look at what we already have available to do the management uh, and how accessible this is for farmers. So the first technology, which I think most of you are very familiar with using, is agar plating or even selective plating, for example, on TCBS. It's easy and it's very inexpensive, which is probably also the reason why it's so widespread. But if you look at it from a perspective of wanting to manage the microbiome, it has some drawbacks. And one of them is that it's relatively slow because we need to wait for the organisms to grow for 24 or 48 hours. Another, and I think that's the biggest problem, uh, disadvantage is that it's semi-quantitative because as you all know, many bacteria actually don't grow well on agar or in certain yeah, physiological conditions don't grow well on agar which means that whatever you get from that measurement, it's always only a part of the microbiome that you're looking at. And that links also to, to the last point, because we don't have that complete view on what is really going on, it's very difficult to make management decisions based on just agar plating results. Another technique that is used a lot, uh, then more for diagnostics, is qPCR, and that's also relatively easy. It's quantitative, which is its biggest advantage, in my opinion. Uh, one disadvantage from the perspective of management, of course, is that you only have a few or one target organism. So if you want to manage your system and you want to keep an eye on a lot of different organisms at the same time, that means you need to do a lot of qPCRs um, in parallel with each other. Also here, um, the link between those abundances that you get from qPCR and the link between performance, it's actually not that clear to make. So also here, just doing management based on qPCR is a little bit difficult. Then finally, the last technique uh, that I just wanted to bring up is uh, next generation sequencing, which we use a lot in academic research because it gives us a view on the full uh, community. However, this technique, it's difficult and expensive. It's not um, feasible for a farmer to be using this uh, on a daily basis on site. It's semi-quantitative as well because you only get the relative abundances and not the absolute abundances. And even with all of that information that you get, linking it to performance is very difficult. You just have a list of different uh, bacterial species and their abundance, but coupling that to performance is very difficult. So what we want to do with Kytos is we definitely don't want to replace all of these technologies, but we just want to add some uh, technologies to this toolbox. That's mainly improving here on the last uh, point. So we want to have technologies that provide insights that can really be linked to performance and that can also really be actionable for the farmer so that the farmer sees the measure measurements and that they can take action based on that to improve their cultivation. So how does that work? Uh, we call our approach microbial fingerprinting. So what do you need for microbial fingerprinting? Actually only a very small sample. So we mainly do our analysis on water and for water samples, we need approximately one milliliter of water. We can also do fingerprinting on gut or on sediment, depending on the research questions of the uh, farmer or the compartments where they, uh, they need the most assistance. Uh, and also for those two, we need really small amounts of um, sample. Once we've collected that sample, we uh, analyze uh, the microbiome in this sample, and we do that using uh, single cell technologies. So many of our technologies are based on cytometry. And what does that single te cell technologies mean? It actually means that every cell inside the sample will be analyzed one by one. So for every cell in a sample, we will characterize, uh, well, we will characterize every cell in a sample. So we get a very big, um, very big load of information per sample. And the nice thing uh, about analyzing the sample cell by cell is that we can analyze all kinds of cells. So in one measurement, we get information on bacteria, but also on the spores of molds, for example, on algae, on some yeast, and even sometimes on large viruses. And from this big data, we, and that is what we are specialized in, 
calculate metrics that can help farmers to steer their system. So I indicated a few of the metrics that uh, we frequently use here. So diversity, that's a a parameter that you probably know that says something about how many species are there, how are the relative fractions of the species uh, compared to each other. We can very accurately determine cell densities for all groups of uh, organisms, so bacteria, algae, and so on. We also have species identification algorithms, so we can identify specific specific species based on the data that we have. And then we have a bunch of other indicators as well. We split up these indicators into two types of indicators. And the first type is the health tools, where we really um, try to um, increase the health of the system. And the second is uh, farm management tools that are really um, targeting day-to-day management decisions for the farmer. So I'll give a quick overview of some of the most uh, widely used. So this is not an exhaustive list, there are more. Um, but for the health tools, what we often use is the microbial load, the diversity that's also very important for the uh, health of the system. We have algae identification because, for example, cyanobacteria are not something that you want in the system. And we also have an indicator for uh, growth of opportunistic pathogens, such as, for example, uh, growth of vibrios. In the farm management tools, then, those are a bit more the practical uh, metrics that we have. Uh, we have a metric that quantifies exactly your uh, bioflux formation. So do you have relatively uh, a lot of bioflux or le um, less or more cells that are just uh, present in suspensions? Are the bioflux large or small and so on? Activity is also a measure that we often use because um, if you overfeed your system, your bacteria typically become more active. So this is a very good indicator uh, to see whether uh, a system is not being overfed. We have specific species markers as well. And we have a trophic index, which I will show in more detail later, that gives a balance between heterotrophs and autotrophs. So between the bacteria and also your algae in the system. So we do want to make a difference. And how do we see this in practice? Now, this is for a pond, but you can imagine exactly the same uh, example for a hatchery system in the tanks. So we want to determine these parameters for each system. And if we see, for example, ah, there's a high bacterial productivity, that means that the farmer needs to check whether he's overfeeding. If there's a system where we see on ah, the system is very heterotrophic, if that's what the farmer was intending to do, then OK, no actions are needed. In this pond, for example, we see ah, there's a very high vibrio risk. Well, that means that the farmer needs to do an emergency sanitation. So we want to give actionable insights. As I said, the company exists for more or less one year. So we've been doing a lot of projects very close to home, so in Europe, but we've also been doing projects in America and even in Asia. And we've uh, already done management for a very wide range of species. So shrimp, but several uh, types of fish species as well, and even oysters. Our lab is based in um, Belgium right here. But as I said, we want to bring that management tool towards the farmer. So it's important for us to be active, very close to where the farms are. So we're also starting up labs at other locations um, close to where uh, the farmer's needs are. So our lab in Vietnam will be up and running in about a month or a month and a half. And this brings me to the case study. So uh, I brought three examples of where we do microbiome management, of where we used our fingerprinting technology to detect how we could do uh, microbiome management that I want to share with you. So the first is an example of how important water preparation in a hatchery is for uh, the health of the cultivation. So what you see here is data from a shrimp hatchery. So we monitored the shrimp hatchery from uh, the very beginning until the end. Uh, but I show here the bacterial cell densities for the first two days. So day zero actually corresponds to the time before stocking. And day one corresponds to 21 hours after stocking. And we monitored five replicate tanks in the farm. So these five colors are corresponding to the five replicate tanks. And what you see is that before stocking, those tanks were quite similar. But after uh, 21 hours, there's one tank, the yellow one that you see here, that seems to be deviating from the other tanks. Now, what happened over the following days is that this yellow tank um, completely crashed. So all the shrimp larvae that were living inside of that tank died within the course of about eight days. So based on those very sensitive measurements of the microbiome that we do, 
actually we could have already have foreseen on beforehand that a corrective action was required for this one tank that was strongly deviating. And if we collect enough uh, data, what we can actually do is what I try to indicate here, is we determine boundaries for your system to say, ah, if you at this day in your cultivation have this value for that parameter, then maybe you should have a look at this or that, and you need to um, take an action to make sure that your cultivation will be um, having a high performance. So we really create these early warning systems for hatcheries. The second example I want to show is about um, how we help farmers to steer their management practices. Uh, for example, by quantifying how the balance between heterotroph bacteria and autotrophic algae are in the system. So um, as you know, every farmer has an idea on how they uh, ideally like to manage their system. And some like to have bioflow uh, system, some use green water system or even clear water system. And uh, if you look at it, it's not hard to see which of the two will be the green water system. However, it is hard to see to have an idea um, on how the ratio between your bacteria and your algae is and whether that's stable across your ponds and or across your tanks and also over time. And that parameter, that ratio between bacteria and algae, that's something that you want to keep really stable. Because you don't want, for example, that uh, if some algae die, there's a very big spark of bacterial growth using the nutrients that they get from the dead algae. The other way around, if you don't want to have a green water system, but you just add some algae uh, to feed your larvae, you don't want those algae to become uh, to grow out very strongly and to become completely dominant in your system. So managing that balance between algae and bacteria is something that's very important for a farmer. So we developed an index, which is our heterotrophic index, and you can see that um, illustrated here. If the index is close to 100%, that means you have a very heterotrophic system, so many bacteria and less algae. If it's um, close to zero or even negative, that means autotrophic, so many algae and less bacteria. And then there's also mixotrophic, which is kind of a combination of the two. Now, this is an example of a farmer uh, that has six uh, different ponds. And as you can see, all of his ponds are more or less in the same range as some ponds were a bit more heterotrophic, others were a bit more mixotrophic, but overall, the, um, across the tanks, those uh, values were quite comparable. However, that's not always the case. This is another example of a farm in the same country where um, instead of having all kind of heterotrophic ponds, this farmer had systems that were really in the autotrophic zone, systems that were really in the mixotrophic zone, and then systems that were already towards the heterotrophic zone. So for this farmer, it's very important that he can use this indicator to see, ah, there's really differences between my ponds, and I should take an action to make them more um, heading towards heterotrophic or autotrophic, depending on how he wants to manage his system. Not only does this uh, parameter show you between ponds whether or not you have the same kind of ratios, you can also use it in one pond or in one tank, in a cultivation tank of a hatchery, over time to see whether you maybe have uh, blooms of algae. So this is an example of a pond again, uh, which was monitored for 120 days, so in this case it was not a hatchery. Uh, and you see again here uh, the heterotrophic, mixotrophic, and autotrophic zone. And you see that there's very regularly spikes towards the autotrophic zone. And these are always um, algal blooms that occurred. So for the farmer, the moment where he sees that there's an algal bloom, that's typically here. But if he would have been monitoring his system, already here he would have seen, ah, oh, my balance between bacteria and algae is shifting very much to watch my algae, and this is going very quickly. I should take an action to make sure that that doesn't go out of control, and I don't have a complete uh, boom of algae in my system. So this is how that parameter should help um, the farmers to uh, do their management more effectively. Of course, we're not interested only in how many algae are there in the system. We also want to know which algae are in the system because some of them we want to have in the system and others we don't. So this is an overview of the um, species that we currently have in our database so that we can quantify exactly how abundant they are in your system. So these are a lot of, of most widely used genera, but we also have, for example, the flagellar and, and a group of non-flagellar other uh, cyanobacteria, which of course you don't want in your system. And I have a use case of this as well. So this is the algal density 
these two yellow and red are cyanobacteria groups. And the upper um, figure gives the beneficial algae and their abundances. Uh, what you see here is that over time, there's really booms and crashes of each of the algal species. But sometimes, and this that happened in this farm, there can be an outgrowth of these cyanobacteria. And these cyanobacteria, we really don't want in this system. So what happened at this point, so at the dotted line, the farmer decided to take an action and to uh, do some kind of algicide product to really suppress those cyanobacteria. And you see that very effectively, these cyanobacteria were then suppressed. And very interesting to see as well is that we could track that the beneficial algae were not necessarily removed from the system. So this is a perfect use case of how that fingerprinting can help you to get an insight into your microbiome and to do your management uh, as effectively as possible to protect uh, your cultivated organisms. And this brings me to uh, the final example that I want to show, which is um, we can try to help farmers identify the moment where they should be using uh, some kind of product. So what you see here uh, is the bacterial diversity. So that's one of the other parameters that we have over time. And again, this was for uh, a pond system and uh, not for a hatchery tank, but you can imagine exactly the same scenario in a hatchery system. And the gray lines are all kinds of ponds that they had good performance, while this yellow line is actually a pond that had very bad performance. And what we see is actually right after stocking, and that's something we see a lot, after stocking that uh, pond that had bad performance was deviating from the other ponds. After that, the diversity seemed to be increasing a lot and it seemed to behave more again like the other ponds. However, after a week or two, the diversity in that uh, pond was again very low and it took quite some this time is, um, for the pond to, um, to, well, for a very long period, the diversity in that pond remained low. And it was only after approximately one month of low diversity that the farmer for the first time observed that there was mortality in his pond. So for a month, the microbiome was actually uh, un not in a good state. And after only one month, the farmer saw that something was wrong. So then he took an emergency protocol to try to recover microbiome health. Now, if he would have been monitoring his system using our fingerprinting technology and in real time have adjusted his management onto that, he could have seen already at the start that maybe he should use some kind of sanitization and some probiotic to fix uh, the dysbiosis in the tank at startup. Even if he wouldn't have done that, after one month, he would have seen that there seemed to be a problem in the tank, that the diversity was really lower than what we would want the diversity to be. And he could have taken action, for example, with some kind of sanitation and with probiotics. That way, the time of having a bad microbiome and the time between starting his treatment would have been much smaller. He would have won three weeks of not having mortality in his system. So this is, again, a use case of how farmers can use that microbial fingerprinting to make sure that their cultivation is as stable and as productive as possible. So this brings me to the end of uh, the case studies. Now I just have one final slide to give you a bit an idea on how we work. So we have either um, project-based uh, work and we have commercial services. So our commercial services, uh, there we just monitor tanks or ponds of farmers in a very routine way and you get updates every week or every few days on what the status in your microbiome is. Uh, and then we also work project based that's for example for product developers or for um, farmers that want to compare different treatments that they are testing to see what is the effect of a treatment or a product that I'm using on my microbiome and on the health of my cultivated organisms. So. And that's the end of my presentation. I would like to thank you for listening and I would uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you, Yasmin. Great presentation. And our last speaker is Konstantinos Bonbolis, product manager of the Aqua Manager Software Suite. Konstantinos has a degree in computer engineering from the University of Patras followed by courses in web development at the National and Capodistrian University of Athens. Konstantinos worked as a software consultant and a business development analyst before finding his true calling in the digital transformation of the aquaculture industry, 
The title of his presentation is Advanced Aquaculture Software for Integrated Fish Hatchery Management. Konstantinos, hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Lucia. Um, thanks for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be part of this uh, panel. And uh, thank you very much for the uh, invitation, of course. I will start sharing my screen with you. So please let me know if you can uh, see my screen. Not yet. What about now? Yeah, that's okay. Perfect. Great. So uh, as Lucia mentioned, uh, we'll be talking uh, a little bit about one of the core modules of Aqua Manager, which is the hatchery module today. And uh, of course, we will dive into the details and uh, focus a little bit on what you can get out of a system, an advanced system like this, and what it can offer essentially to a, a fish hatchery. And not only a fish hatchery, actually, it can also be applicable for a shrimp industry as well. Uh, so first of all, I would like to, to talk to you a little bit about the company, about Aqua Manager. So Aqua Manager started as a production management software, as you know, more than 20 years ago. Uh, and today we have expanded a little bit to the physical world as well, trying to, uh, to bridge, let's say, software with uh, smart equipment. And our ultimate goal, of course, is to uh, help aquaculture, this very promising uh, sector and with a huge potential uh, towards the digital transformation uh, in order to respond, of course, to, to the more and more um, uh, challenging uh, thing of producing uh, more feed, more food for, to feed the population at the highest quality levels. And of course, uh, by making sure that we preserve the environment and using less resources. And uh, how we do this, we do it, of course, we started doing this uh, through Aqua Manager software, the suite that uh, of course includes the Aqua Manager hatchery uh, module. And we are working towards an automated uh, aquaculture precision farming ecosystem. Uh, we have worked in multiple countries uh, all over the world uh, these uh, last 20 years. We have more than 156 clients in 53 countries or so. Uh, we have uh, worked on projects uh, both for the grow out farms as well as hatcheries. We have customers who, who do the full cycle, uh, full production cycle. So uh, starting from the broodstock fees all the way up to the, uh, high, to the, to the dispatch of the fees to the processing plants. And uh, we have worked with various species as well. Um, we started from Bass and Brim in the Mediterranean, but we have very quickly moved uh, all over the place. You know, nowadays our uh, customers consist of both open sea uh, companies uh, and land-based facilities, including hatcheries, of course, and uh, RAS systems. And we are also working, as I mentioned, um, on both fees and streams. Uh, so you can see that we have a very uh, uh, big reach in terms of customers and regions where we are operating. And uh, those are the main pillars uh, of our solutions. Allow me to get my pointer on here. So today we will be focusing on the management software and to be more specific on the hatchery module of the management software. But as you may see, this is just the beginning. This is just the first pillar of what we can get actually out of your data, what you can get out of the digitalization of the production process. And, um, you know, aquaculture has a lot of room to improve. Uh, when you are looking at industries like uh, cattle or um, uh, swine uh, or uh, poultry, you see that those industries are already making a very big use of uh, what technology has to offer. But so far, aquaculture is still in its infancy when it comes to technology adoption. And this is where we come in, starting from uh, Aqua Manager Hatchery, of course, and trying to address uh, the challenges of a hatchery production. And first of all, what is the biggest uh, issue uh, or challenge in the hatcheries is, of course, the complicated production process. Uh, you might have hatcheries who have departments for broodstock fees, broodstock that are, uh, that are ID'd. There are also some organizations who run genetic programs. Uh, you might have intubation tanks or intubation rooms. You have your feast tanks, like larvae rearing feast tanks or weaning or adaptation tanks. Uh, you might be doing the nursery phase in your hatchery facilities. 
of course, as you know, uh, a lot of hatcheries also produce live feed, uh, like algae, rotifers, and artemias. So what we uh, we started to do and what we need to do is try to um, to organize all those processes under one uh, suit. Uh, suite, uh, one software, let's say, uh, where you have full control and full management of the production process. And uh, of course, uh, hatchery uh, comes with a lot of challenges when it comes to feed sensitivity, like in the grow up, to conversion rates, to health issues, to biosecurity. Uh, most of the hatcheries work like um, factories. For instance, if, if something breaks out, if you have an issue, especially if you have um, a disease or you are uh, a disease breakout or something uh, is out of range, out of control, you might have extreme losses and might end up, you know, you might end up losing a lot of money and a lot of time and you might be doing a lot of damage to the environment. Uh, it is also very difficult to make decisions without a system that allows you to have full control of the data behind it. Uh, so far, most of the hatcheries have used experience to work. What we are trying to do is move this experience-based aquaculture to our, towards knowledge-based aquaculture. So we want to extract information to help the management of the companies to make the right decisions. Uh, and of course, throughout this process, you get better planning and scheduling of the tasks, of the registrations, of whatever happens in your uh, production. And you are able, of course, if you have, if you have a production system in place, what you can do that you cannot do without it uh, is respond to challenges and issues and problems in real time when they happen, as they happen. And uh, of course, everybody wants to produce sustainably. Uh, not only, uh, of course, cost-wise, but also ensure fish welfare and respect the environment and try to produce in a more efficient way. I will. Uh, I would like to focus a little bit on on an actual use case before uh, taking a look into what the software can do for the hatchery producers. Uh, this is an actual use case that we run on data that we got from um, from a very big company that is uh, we are working with uh, since many years, and uh, this is a big data analysis, and uh, it shows uh, the variable importance. How important is Specific, a specific variable out of the data set that we collected uh, when it comes to, to, to a specific business question. And you see that in the first place here, you see that the hatchery A had a very big importance in the data set that we collected. While at the same time, another hatchery where they were, where uh, they provided fish from had the least importance. So you may understand, this is a company that produces, uh, uh, that, that does grow out of fish, okay. Uh, that grows fish. And the most important factor in determining the um, performance of the production, you see that is the hatcheries, essentially. And how can we uh, work with a system, uh, with an advanced ICT system, of course, uh, and how it differs, of course, from what you've been using or you might be using if you're using Excel sheets, spreadsheets, or even paper sheets in, in some cases. Uh, out of a system like Aqua Manager, you can get complete traceability. It is a software that is designed to work uh, or with multiple parameters, with many tanks, many units, many raceways. Uh, you do a lot of very frequent transfers, so it was optimized straight from the beginning to provide very quick access to this information. And when you have access to this information, apart from the real time, um, idea of what is happening in your production, you can end up to an operational efficiency, to a greater operational efficiency. And what you see here is a very important keyword, the cost reduction. How can you know, how, how can you reduce the cost of your production if you don't know the cost? So what we are trying to do is to give a very accurate depiction of the exact cost of the fees on each department break down, uh, broken down per department uh, to identify the uh, per unit and per fees or per biomass, the exact cost and its core components. And of course, out of a system like Aqua Manager, what you can also get is a data model that is very suitable for further analysis and reporting. Uh, so you can pretty much generate and create 
any kind of analysis uh, through pivot tables, through graphs, uh, through visualizations that you might want to. Uh, and let's check some of the core functionality of the system because I'm, I know that I talked a lot, so now it's maybe time to, to see a little bit of uh, what the system looks like. And uh, I want you to focus a little bit here at the top on the main ribbon of the system. What you see here, of course, is just a home screen of what Aqua Manager Hatchery uh, Windows version looks like. You see that the system is broken down into departments. You have the Brutstock department here, uh, that uh, includes all the registrations that might take place on a daily basis, from stockings of new broodstock to feedings to mortalities to transfers between one tank and another, uh, to having real time overviews and layouts of the facility and so on. And you can also see that it includes departments for the incubator tanks, if you, if of course incubation tanks are uh, are used in the production, feast tanks. And uh, of course, for the situations for the for the customers that do so, there is also a live feed department like algae, rotifers, and artemia. Uh, what is also included in the system is an inventory management tool that allows you to register whatever goes into your storerooms, whatever goes out. So this way, you can know what was consumed by the fees throughout their lifetime, even uh, the cost that is associated with this consumable. Uh, and of course, you have uh, dedicated reports and statistics. And last but not least, you can get the accurate depiction that we were talking about, about, uh, about the cost of your production. And you can run production plans to see and budget on what is going to happen in the future, uh, get an idea of how much this will cost you, how uh, fast you can reach your goals, what is the capacity uh, in order to reach the, those goals. Uh, through a dedicated system, uh, of course, like uh, Aqua Manager Hatcher, you can get a lot of user-defined dashboards, meaning that you are not limited to what is already existing in the software. Uh, you might have users that uh, might be very interesting in SQL Solidate information. You might be having uh, hatchery facilities in multiple regions throughout the world or in the same country. Uh, and you might want to benchmark. Uh, this is the flexibility that you get out of a system like this. Uh, so you are not served, let's say, reports, but you can also create reports and dashboards based on the exact needs of its specific uh, production, of course. Same goes for the analysis capabilities. When you are working um, with data sets, you know, from spreadsheets, from Excel sheets, uh, you often end up with having something monstrous, something huge, you know, a lot of data, a lot of uh, spreadsheets, a lot of tabs. So you might get lost, you know, and at some point you also have performance issues. You might be, you might need one minute, let's say, or two minutes to get the report that you wish. Uh, but through a system, uh, through a dedicated system like this, you can, of course, get the exact charts and visualizations that you want out of the pre-existing, of course, tables that you can find into the system. And uh, this goes hand to hand, of course, with information that you can see in real time that we talked about. So apart from overviews in a tabular format, you might also want to have a visual representation of your production. Uh, and in some cases, you might also be able to, um, uh, to be notified when something exceeds from specific limits that you set to the system. Uh, if, for instance, uh, the biological FCR seems to be exceeding the limits, or if uh, the mortality rates uh, are very high, or if the water quality measurements that are being registered into, the, into Aqua Manager are out of range. Uh, this way, you can be proactive, you can know what is happening, and you can... Uh, let's say, identify uh, issues, uh, you know, trends, patterns, uh, as they happen, as soon as they happen, essentially. It all starts from, of course, registering data into the system. So for this reason, you know, you, you know there are multiple ways of, um, of uh, addressing uh, the whole data input uh, thing. One of those is, of course, the mobile uh, apps. We have developed mobile apps that allow uh, both real-time registration of what is happening in the farm, like 
uh, when you go uh, buy a tank, for instance, and you provide some feed, or you are measuring the survivability rates, or you are measuring water quality parameters, you can either directly register them into Aqua Manager on your uh, laptop, or you can use the mobile devices to register information on the field. And the same goes for the management application that allows you to see information, to get reports in real time, like you have your production in your pocket, essentially. Uh, so what this can, uh, can bring as a benefit uh, is, of course, the real-time registration. Uh, you extend the core processes of the system to your personnel. And of course, you can empower your personnel. Uh, they feel that they're doing something very advanced, you know, and they are part of it. Uh, they know that whatever they are going to, to be registering is going to be utilized to improve performance and optimize uh, the production at the end of the day. And let's get uh, straight to a point that, uh, of course, is very, very important, not only for the hatcheries, but for the whole aquaculture sector, uh, but uh, especially for the hatchery facilities, uh, you, you do a very frequent very frequent transfers from one tank to, a, to another, especially in the nursery phase. So uh, a system like Aqua Manager can provide seamless traceability. Uh, so you can both know where a population came from. So you see here in this example, this is the, uh, the tank that we are looking uh, at right now, uh, which came from this tank, that came from this tank. It was a transfer that uh, happened on this day from this tank. You can also see the transfer types the amount of fish that were transferred, uh, the type, of course, if it, if it was eggs, if it was uh, larvae and so on. And you, can, uh, you are able also to see the incubation tanks that they were moved from if they uh, passed through incubation tanks, as well as the, as the broodstock tanks and even the broodstock, the, uh, the specific broodstock tagged by the IDs that you see here that your uh, eggs came from. So this information follows the fish life from the egg up until the grow out. And uh, what this can lead us to is, of course, ultimately to, to have a very big opportunity of benchmarking performance. Whether this is benchmarking uh, on closed units, on closed populations, to identify which one of your uh, families or your uh, batches of fish overperformed, which one underperformed, uh, why it underperforms or overperforms. So you are also able to dive into those details, uh, choose the best families, let's say the best broodstock that produce um, uh, the best offspring, of course, with uh, the lowest FCR, with the uh, uh, highest uh, conversion and growth rates and so on. Uh, and here in this example, of course, we have, leveraged, uh, we have leveraged data that have been introduced into the system. And you see per batch here, you see, for instance, what was the initial number of fish that was, uh, that was uh, uh, spawned? What was uh, the number of dead fish, the adjustments, the dispatch number at the end of the day? Uh, you can either dispatch it to your own hatcheries or you can dispatch it to your customers directly. Uh, so if one of the customers produces a full cycle uh, aquaculture, let's say product, uh, you can you either have, have the option to dispatch uh, this, uh, you also, sorry, have the option to dispatch your fish from the hatcheries to the growth facilities and have traceability all the way back to the broodstock fish. So at the end of the day, you can know and you can tell both your, your consumers and your customers, um, uh, as well as certification bodies, that this is what uh, the performance of my fish looks like. This is what they ate. This is what they went through. The full history of your populations, essentially. And let's get back to the cost account part. Uh, the cost accounting part, of course, is something that is pain uh, for many people, for many companies. And without a proper management tool, there is no way to know the exact cost of your fees. Uh, and here in this example, you can see the analytical breakdown that you can have at, at the end of the day. As we discussed earlier, uh, the system knows what you give to your fees, to your populations. It knows how much they consumed. It knows, uh, it knows how much this uh, costs. 
And uh, in addition to that, uh, we can even uh, input the general expenses of their production in the system, uh, as well as set the distribution of those costs among different departments in the hatchery process. And at the end of the day, have an analytical uh, view uh, of the exact cost of my fees, tank by tank, as you can see here. So for instance, you see the total cost of the fees that exist in a specific tank, the cost per item, the cost per fees, or uh, the fry cost or egg cost if you uh, procured the eggs, the algae cost if at some point in the fish life or in its uh, feed, in the dry feed that you give, uh, that you give it, or a rotifer or artemia, algae was consumed as well, you will be able to see it here. The rotifer cost, the artemia cost, the dry feed cost, you have a very analytical breakdown of the cost at the end of the day. And of course, you can see those costs, you can compare generations, you can compare batches and uh, analyze uh, the ones that cost you a lot and uh, then further uh, deep dive into the details on why this happened. Uh, of course, you can also set into the limit, uh, into the system uh, limits and alerts, and you are also be uh, able to see uh, if something exceeds those limits uh, in a daily basis. So no need to, to, to close the population or dispatch your fees to know uh, what the production looks like or what the performance of uh, each one of the batches uh, looks like. Uh, last but not least, and when it comes to, uh, to the functionality of the system, we, uh, a very important aspect of it is the production planning, of course, because, okay, it's good to know uh, what is uh, happening uh, today in real time, uh, the performance of my past populations, but, but what about the future? What about budgeting and trying to identify which one of uh, my production plans works best for me? So the system allows you to run multiple production plans, compare those plans between one another and choose the ones that work best for you. And those plans uh, include both biological information. So when the populations are going to reach a specific average weight, let's say, or when my eggs are going to be hatching, uh, as well as the cost that is associated with this production. Uh, to cut a long story short, um, uh, I would like to, to, to also uh, talk a little bit about the end goal. Because when you have data and good and valid data, uh, you can then use this data uh, through machine learning and through external tools that we have also created uh, to use the past in order to predict the future essentially. So what we can do is we can extract information and the customer can also do it uh, on their own, uh, extract information from Aqua Manager's database and through machine learning algorithms, uh, we can also re-engineer those models. Or if there are no models, no growth models, no suggested feed rate tables, no protocols in place, we can even create those from scratch. Because so far we've seen and we have identified, and I'm talking on a personal experience, of course, that a lot of customers do not have accurate uh, models, do not have accurate protocols. They are just using generic ones um, because of lack of uh, you know, further analysis and uh, the ability to actually extract this information from the past. So this is where uh, the end goal of a system in place can lead you to. And uh, of course, some of the extra benefits that you get by using um, uh, a dedicated uh, production management module is the data quality. Uh, because uh, systems like this often come um, together with uh, validations. So you, you cannot uh, write down inconsistencies in the database. Uh, you end up having operational efficiency. You come up with best practices. You come up with ways and workflows and processes that allow you to do your work in a much more efficient way. And of course, you also have the ability to compare these uh, performance changes to what this means economically to the farm. And uh, at the same time, also make sure that you provide better service to your customers uh, you have real-time monitoring and control of what is happening in your production. And don't forget that systems like Aqua Manager uh, are open to integrations and automation, meaning that 
it can be integrated with uh, automated feeding machines, uh, with uh, data logging devices that are in place, uh, or, or we can procure, uh, and uh, as well as other kind of software like ERPs. So you don't have to double register, uh, register things in some cases. Um, this is, for example, um, the inventory um, integration is one of the, of the most common integration points that we have identified so far. And of course, you can create a knowledge, a knowledge base at the end of the day. So uh, a lot of you uh, have already seen that when working in aquaculture, usually when it comes to production management, there are people who have created and developed extensive spreadsheets uh, and tools that they and only they are able to understand and operate. But by having something in place that allows you to, to speak a common language, you end up having a base uh, and a basis, of course, uh, to uh, onboard additional people, additional personnel, and it's a very easy process. Um, so you start creating this culture in the company, which is very, very beneficial. It cannot be measured, of course, uh, but at the end of the day, this is some of the most important things that you can get out of a production management system. And uh, allow me to also show you what our vision is, what our, uh, what our dream is of uh, having uh, one day and what we are also already working uh, with, with some of our customers. So what we want to do is to build a digitally managed hatchery. Uh, whether it is one hatchery location, one facility, or part of a whole group of uh, hatcheries and uh, bigger aquaculture uh, groups, uh, we want to have a control center uh, that allows you to have production control, feeding control, management of the whole process uh, at the farm that is automatically connected with any smart equipment that there is in place or we procure like feeding system and loggers that I uh, uh, mentioned earlier. And at the end of the day, you have the top level management uh, who has uh, the control of the whole operation, of course, the planning of the future, the cost um, um, information and the uh, 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 and you know and the the exact uh, way of having access to this information and on top of that you can work on specific analysis through business intelligence and benchmarking all the way up to modeling uh, through innovative tools and uh, cloud platforms. So this is more or less what we are doing. And uh, if you would like, of course, you may use my email here to the, directly send me any queries. Uh, and of course, I will be very happy to, to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Constantinos. Great presentation. And thank you all for the great presentations. I would like to ask our panelists to turn on their, their videos and to begin the, the Q&A session. So let's start with Warren. Are you there, Warren? Hi. No. Okay. Here's a question for you. Does high level of DO from yeah. nanobubble contribute to the gas bubble disease? No, it does not. It's, so that's a relative question because it depends on the amount of dissolved oxygen and the other the other partial pressures of the gases in solution. So hypothetically speaking, right, the a lot of the gas bubble associated um, questions come from when there's elevated nitrogen in the water. So as long as you're managing your nitrogen levels in the water and you're not exceeding your oxygen by a significant degree. So hypothetically speaking, in most cases, farmers are, are aiming for anywhere between um, 80 and 100% saturation of dissolved oxygen level. And as long as you're managing your DO accordingly, there should be minimal risk to, to gas bubble disease. Okay, thank you. Bertrand, can your system be used instead of biological and mechanical filter to improve the water quality and remove waste? Um, well, it's, it's, it has to be used. It's better to use it uh, after mechanical filtration, such as drum filters, uh, but you can increase the, the size of the mesh. For example, you can have a 100 micron mesh instead of uh, 20 micron mesh, because the, 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 the vacuum lift can, can extract the rest, can do the rest of the, of the work in, in terms of extraction. 
So, but it's nice to have both of them because it's a very high efficiency combination of for the water treatment to increase quality. Uh, concerning uh, biofiltration, uh, it's um, we do extract uh, nitrogen or ammonia using the technology, but uh, it's it's in an intensive rust system. It's better to to have a biofilter uh, like MBVR in in the in the treatments. Okay, thank you, Jasmine. Can you tell us the advantages of using your technology in RAS systems? Uh, yes, that's indeed a good question. So we actually have indicators for uh, each specific system itself. So uh, for RAS systems, we will use maybe uh, different indicators than um, what we would use, for example, for a pond or for a, a tank a hatchery system. So specifically for us, we have some indicators that um, are, for example, for the, the the, the detection of sapolechnia uh, spores, because in especially in RAS systems, that's a very big problem. Uh, on top of that, we also have uh, indicators for, uh, or we're working on indicators for nitrification, uh, because as you know, uh, accumulation of nitrification in a RAS system is a very big problem. So even for that, uh, we make uh, tailored um, parameters. So we really try to help you with specific parameters for the system that you are working in. And also this threshold that I showed, like the green and the red zone, we define those based on uh, the system that you are working in. Okay, thank you. Constantinos, uh, does your software can be adapted to different shellfish species? Yeah, actually we have tried to adapt it for selfies. Of course, uh, shrimps can also be considered selfies. <laughs> I don't know if this is the question. Uh, when it comes to shrimps, yes, there is also a dedicated shrimp version of the system. Of course, it has uh, a lot of similarities to the, uh, to the fish version uh, because the processes are pretty much the same. Uh, however, if we're talking about selfies like oyst uh, oysters or mussels, in the past we have tried uh, to uh, to develop a specific version for this as well, but uh, we saw that there is a lot of complexity, not complexity actually, there are a lot of different ways of doing the same job. So we, we found out that one customer might be doing this uh, one thing and another one might be doing a completely different thing. So it was very hard to get, let's say a common uh, solution uh, to, to, to develop something that fits the whole industry. Uh, so for this purpose, we um, we pretty much um, uh, started, you know, moving away from the project. Of course, it is still operational. Some of, some farms, especially in the in the US, uh, are still using it, but uh, now nowadays we are not actively maintaining it. Okay, thank you, Warren. Are nanobubbles stable in turbulence? No, sorry, that's not the question. What additional benefits have you observed from nanobubbles in hatcheries that may differ from dissolved oxygen? So specifically to the, 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 the charge of the, the nanobubble itself and the ability to remove uh, various kinds of particulates and what we say generally as inhibitory compounds from the water. So really it's tied to physical properties of the bubble itself and their way to enhance different processes. And that can mean everything from helping to remove uh, unwanted bacteria, making sure that they're not attaching to surfaces within, a, when they, within the cultivation system um, and disrupting those biological matrices from those surfaces, as well as enhancing particulate removal. And then in looking at other things like whether it be protein skimming, emulsion breaking, and removing proteins from those from those uh, waters, specifically looking at the nanobubble as a sort of a, a non-chemical coagulant uh, effect and helping to remove those. And then as well as to, to promote things like um, ozonation, delivering, delivering um, ozone through nanobubbles. Uh, some of the research has indicated that it can have um, certain um, immune responses within the plants, I mean, within the, within the um, the fish or the, or the uh, animals that we're treating. Um, and so as an overall thing, it certainly is, is promoting the welfare and water conditions in, in different ways that go beyond just uh, dissolved oxygen. Okay, thank you, Bertrand. Have you tried your system in a shrimp hatchery and nursery and in gaseous? And is the system viable also for open pond systems? 
uh, for open funds, you say, Alien? Yeah. Uh, well, we have um, we have been used. We have we are using the system for shrimp uh, farm in uh, California uh, to clarify the water and extract uh, pathogens like bacteria. Uh, for um, for the, the the for gaseous, we are not using the, the we, we don't have any application on gaseous farming, but uh, we have systems running on, on tilapia. Uh, well, it's maybe not exactly the same, but it's kind of close. And uh, concerning open ponds, um, uh, we are using a technology a lot with open ponds, but mainly for microalgae production, not uh, really for fish uh, pond production. But that could uh, be uh, possible. I don't see. I don't see any reason why we couldn't do that. Uh, actually, so no problem. I would be happy to to do it. Okay, thank you. Jasmine, there's a question for you on how your technology can be applied in a SIVAS pre-grow-out phase, specifically to prevent tenacity with baculosis before transferring to, to cage. Uh, that's a very interesting question. So uh, I think our, our technology can uh, help in several aspects there. Um, so one of the things that we are currently very actively developing is an indicator for tenacity baculum. So it should be possible very soon for us to detect whether or not tenacity baculum is present in your system and also get an indication on how abundant uh, this organism is. And next to that, what we typically see, for example, we also uh, recently have a project with Aeromonas. So next to seeing whether or not Aeromonas is present, we also see on our other indicators that there's some kind of trigger that is linked to uh, those disease outbreaks. So I think in the monitoring already, we could help to detect as soon as possible when you have tenacity backroom problems. Uh, but something that I didn't mention much in the presentation, but that we also do is we don't only work with farmers, we also work with the producers of um, compounds to mitigate the diseases. So we also work with producers of probiotics, of peroxides or whatever. And we try together with them to test how their products are really working, what their effect is exactly on the microbiome. And in that way, we then in a later stage, try to couple, not only tell you how much tenacity baculum you have and what the state of your microbiome is, but also to give a recommendation based on what we have measured from several products um, suppliers. So I can't give you an off-the-shelf uh, solution for tenacity baculum, but it's something that we're very actively working on. Okay, great. Constantinos, what's the subscription price of this software? So when it comes to subscription, uh, it's basically uh, a license-based uh, policy that we are following. So there are two options here. You either purchase the license and then you pay a maintenance, uh, a yearly fee for, uh, for the maintenance that includes support, of course, and the, the, newer, the newer updates of the system. And the second option is to rent the license uh, where uh, you, of course, can pay into in, uh, in installments of usually six months. And uh, this also includes the maintenance of the software. The total cost, of course, depends on the production volume in uh, fryer or fingerlings per year uh, and the number of uh, hatcheries that we are talking about. So to give an accurate estimation of the cost, I would have to, to have this information first. And of course, a choice uh, between the two options. Okay, thank you. I think anybody who wants to know more can contact you directly. Uh, abso absolutely, you can. You may contact me directly. Okay, Warren, here's a question for you. Can nanobubble technology be applied in bioflock production systems? Yes, it can. Yes, it, yes, it can. And, and specifically in terms of improving the biokinetics of that flock and making sure that they are active. And if you were looking at um, the oxygen uptake rate of that bioflock, you would see an improvement. So we do use this technology very consistently in, um, in, in various kinds of water treatments where you're using it in activated sludge. And typically, we, if you're looking at the biokinetics of that sludge in terms of, and if you were looking at the oxygen uptake rate, we typically see anywhere between a, a 15 to 20% improvement in the efficiency there. So definitely, Promoting the health of bioflock is, is a, a big proponent of, of what the nanobubbles can do. Okay, thank you. Bertrand, what is your oldest system running in a, in a hatchery? 
uh, in a hatchery, we, uh, we, the first time we set up a, a system uh, which is still running was uh, in France uh, on the Seabream hatchery uh, almost 10 years ago. And it's uh, when we set up the system for foam fractionation, it uh, directly increased the survival rates of the, of the, the fingerlings. And, uh, and, uh, and that's the reason why it's still running. But uh, it was the, the, at that time, the automation was not completely, uh, completely finished, but, still, but however, it's, uh, it's still running. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Jasmine, how does the Kaitos technology compare to the technologies that are being used in hatcheries nowadays, such as plating and chamber counting? Uh, yeah, so as compared to uh, plating, for example, as, as I indicated in the uh, presentation, so for plating, you need to wait those 24 hours or 48 hours uh, before you get the result. So on that aspect alone, uh, our technology is much faster. Uh, to give you an idea, once the sample arrives here, um, it takes approximately half an hour to get the results of your sample. So to get uh, this range of indicators from your sample. So we're really quick. Um, so as long as the sample uh, is easily transferred to our lab, it's possible to get the results very quickly. Uh, and then in terms of precision, which I think is also a very big uh, difference as compared to what is used in practice, as I explained with that plating, and as you all know also, we only see a part of the microbiome and even only a part of the bacterial microbiome. And with our technology, we really see uh, bacteria, algae, even large viruses sometimes, um, yeast and so on. So we really see the complete microbiome and the accuracy of our technology is really high. If there's, um, yeah, a, let's say 5% difference in bacterial abundance, our technology can very accurately identify that. While, for example, for plating, the technology is just not specifically enough to really see those kind of small differences. So okay. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, okay, thank you. Constantinos, how is an advanced and complex software like this introduced in a company? This is actually um, a very important question because uh, as you may understand, uh, systems like uh, like this uh, can be yeah, you know very ad, uh, very in, de in depth and detailed so in order for us to implement the system we go through a process that we have tried and tested uh, multiple times with multiple customers so we approach each one of the implementation uh, projects uh, as a new project for us uh, so we uh, define people who are responsible for running the implementation project. We divide it into specific stages, uh, three to be more specific. Of course, I will not dive into details on those. Uh, just to give you an idea, st stage one or step one is always the preparation of the initial data sets and the infrastructure. If there is no IT infrastructure in place, we can also take care of, uh, of the hosting of the system for the customers. Uh, throughout this process, we, um, uh, we also uh, collect the master data for the initial setup of the database because there is no one size fits all. Uh, each one of our customers have their own uh, ways of doing uh, work, uh, of doing business, their own uh, workflows, their own roles uh, in, the, in the company and so on. The second stage is the actual training on the system. And uh, nowadays, this takes place mostly online, as you may understand. But of course, uh, the option for on-site trainings is uh, still here. Nowadays, uh, we can uh, we have resumed uh, traveling, so this sh shouldn't be a case. In the past, you know, this was uh, much more um, uh, important for the customers. But nowadays, everything can can pretty much take place online. Uh, so during this training uh, period, we divide. Uh, the trainings uh, into different sessions, uh, starting from the simple things like the setup of the system, moving to the transactions, to the reports, to the analysis. So we take it step by step. And throughout the, this process, we make sure that we have constant communication with the customers. This is the most important thing, actually, to understand the challenges first, understand the needs and the issues that they are currently facing, and trying uh, to accommodate those uh, through the system. 
And uh, the third step, of course, is the step of the go live, as we, we call it, uh, which is the actual registration of uh, information to the system, making sure that uh, the setup is um, what uh, we are looking for, uh, maybe adjusting uh, some of, uh, of the reports and the statistics in the system and try to see if there are any things that uh, we can improve uh, and work together with the customer. But once again, the most important thing throughout an implementation period, an implementation project is the communication. Uh, because it's not like you're getting a system that is up and running uh, on day one. You have to work on it, of course. It, it requires some dedication in the first place, but after you, you get familiar with it, you can uh, I, I very easily understand the benefits that you can get out of it. Okay, thank you. Warren, what is the benefit of injecting ozone through your nanobubble generator? Could you, Lucia, could you repeat that? Yeah, what is the ben what is the benefit of injecting ozone through your nanobubble generator? So specifically re relative to the gas transfer, so efficiently getting that gas dissolved immediately into solution. So if you're looking at the the rate of of ozone dissolution, um, you would see an improvement over a, a typical venturi system, which is the most common way of introducing ozone. And then specifically the half-life of that ozone once in solution. Um, and back, going back to types of efficiency is, is if you can immediately do it without pressurizing it, um, you, have an, you have an improvement from the energy efficiency side, but most importantly from a health and safety, you'll see um, if you notice in the presentation that one graph talking about off-gassing, um, when we inject it through the, the nanobubble, you see a substantial reduction in the off-gassing from that ozone. So um, if you've ever worked with ozone and you can smell it in the environment, that is a health and safety concern. You don't want to be smelling ozone, you're typically over the limit. Um, so you, while it, there's certain benefits to using ozone from an oxidation standpoint, um, you definitely don't want to be, a, uh, it, it's sort of having your workers be smelling it. Um, that's, a, that's definitely a, a health and safety concern. So not only maximizing the, the treatment potential of the ozone, but also specifically addressing um, health and safety concerns. Okay, thank you. Bertan, what is the price of the VAL? And is, are you able to set systems all over the world? Uh, yes, of course. We have uh, actually at the moment uh, more than 120 systems uh, running all over the world. Um, the price depends on the size, uh, on options and things like that. But uh, mainly, it's uh, it starts from something like seven, eight, seven, eight thousand uh, dollars to a maximum of uh, one hundred thousand dollars for the very big systems. And um, yeah, and um, we can uh, yeah we can set uh, we can set up systems all over the world. Yeah, no problem. We have uh, systems in uh, in uh, New Zealand, so it's kind of far from us. So well, I guess the rest is not uh, that complicated. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure of that. Jasmine, what is the resolution of Kaito's technology for bacteria, viruses, and fungi? Can you also differentiate different algal groups? Uh, yes, indeed. So as I showed, uh, for the algae, it's very easy to detect the different, um, the different genera. Uh, also for bacteria, that's something we're very actively working on. Um, so we can detect uh, different types uh, or different genera of bacteria. So for example, for the very frequently occurring pathogens like Piperio, Aeromonas, Tenacibaclum, we're actively developing um, these uh, parameters uh, or these indicators. Uh, so yeah, for sure, also for bacteria, that's possible. Uh, and the same goes, for example, for um, saprolegnia uh, spores and so on. We are um, in the process of evaluating to what extent we can um, distinguish closely related species of that as well. Okay, thank you. Konstantinos, who owns the data? Is the data available to anybody apart from the company using the software? This is also... Um... A very good question. Uh, since there is a lot of sensitivity, as you may understand, behind the data and the data ownership, 
uh, in our case, uh, the data always belongs uh, to the customer. So we do not have access to this data unless we are given access uh, for some reason to run a specific analysis, for instance, or if we are to manage, let's say, the, the IT infrastructure. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, the data belong always to the customer. We do not share it. We, there is no centralized, let's say, uh, database. So Aqua Manager uses uh, the Microsoft stack and most, most specifically the database is located on a Microsoft SQL server. So we make sure that uh, the database is always installed on a server that belongs to the customer. And uh, this way uh, uh, we minimize the risks and uh, we make sure that uh, everything stays uh, uh, you know, to, to this server and belongs to the customer. Uh, you know, in some cases, it's not a good thing because this way you cannot benchmark. Uh, but unfortunately, aquaculture is still very, very sensitive, especially the big companies uh, in the industry um, don't want to share data. Uh, even if it is anonymized, you know, well, they're not interested, at least not yet. In the future, we might see how we can approach this whole benchmarking thing to create value for the whole sector and not for a customer specific. Okay. Thank you. And that wraps up the Q&A. For those questions that were not answered live, they will be answered by email. I would like to thank our speakers today, Warren, Bertrand, Jasmine, and Constantinos for your time and your great presentations. And thanks everyone for joining in the World Hatchery Forum. We hope these sessions have been informative and inspiring. They will all be available on YouTube next week. And if you want to stay up to date on the latest news on aquaculture hatcheries, don't forget to subscribe for free to our publications on hatcheryfm.com. See you next time. Goodbye. Bye-bye.